Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Guy Dauncey with the Yellow Point Ecological Society. And it's our pleasure tonight to have with us Kathy Valentine from the Salt Spring Island Natural Cemetery. Welcome, everyone. Kathy was raised in Sawasan on the other side of the Salish Sea from where Salt Spring was considered a total Shangri-La. She's a yoga teacher, a mother of two kids, and she has a philosophy degree from SFU. She lives and farms at the 84 acre Night Owl Farm in the Burgoyne Valley on Salt Spring, where she and her husband Gavin raise belted Galloway cattle, laying hens, meat birds, a couple of horses, orchards and gardens, and where they encourage the biodiversity through nourishing native plants, animals and lime forms. So I'm gonna invite Kathy to speak shortly and, and then we'll have a little explanation of what we're doing in the Yellow Point Ecological Society to develop the idea of a green burial um, site locally in, in Yellow Point. And then we'll go into a Q&A and general discussion. And um, so, Kathy, um, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thanks very much, Guy. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I have prepared a PowerPoint presentation, so you won't see much of my face, but you'll see a, a lot of different photos. And uh, I think you can just switch over to that. Yeah, Guy? Yes, you, you go to the share screen and the thing we discussed before. There we go. Yeah. That look good? You want to give the, the from the beginning, top left. There we go. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So now we begin. That uh, so. Thank you for having me. My name is uh, Catherine Valentine or Kathy Valentine, and uh, I would like to say that I gratefully live on the traditional unceded territory of the Quetzal and Sayot nations. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, and this is this is where I live and this is where I work and raise our family and farm and it's the home of the Salt Spring Island Natural Cemetery. And this presentation is called Green Burial, a tradition of beauty, kindness and generosity. So let me just explain what I mean about a tradition of beauty, kindness, and generosity. A little bit is that it's a tradition. It's a green burial is um, is not a new concept. It's a it's a tradition that humans have participated in for for eternity. And when I say about a beauty, is that it really is a, a beautiful process. It's it's striking and it's beauty in the way that nature is beauty, which is which is full of beauty, right? It's kind, it's kind for the deceased. It has, um, it's respectful and caring. It's kind for the family. It's a whole process involved with kindness. And it's generous because I, I feel, you know, without being too extreme, but we live our entire lives on the earth, eating and walking and pooping and everything that we do on the earth, driving our vehicles. And this is the one thing that we can do at the end that is actually a giving back to the earth is to is to is to give our bodies back. And so there's a generosity in that. It's a it's a, there's a there's a selflessness to it. So that's the generosity. Um, so this presentation has four parts in an introduction to green burial in general, and then the story of the Salt Spring Island Natural Cemetery, and. Thirdly, a, a conversation about what a typical green burial funeral is like. And then fourthly, questions and discussion. But I'm not sure if we'll do that right away after this or later with Guy. We can, we can, we can wing that. If questions come up while I'm talking, you're welcome to write that into the chat or, or make a note yourself and, um, and we can talk about it after. Whoop, whoop. There we go. Okay, so... Uh, just a little beginning to, to, to try to get you a bit involved is uh, here is our new king, Charles, and with his deceased mother in the background. So a little inspiration to think about how have humans historically and, and globally disposed of the deceased. And dispose might sound a bit harsh if you're not in the world of funerals and cemeteries, but a disposition is, is what we do with, with, our, with our dead. Is we, we, uh, it's, it's carried through a disposition. So disposed, that comes from disposed and disposed comes from that. So what have we historically, how have we historically and globally disposed of the deceased? 
if anyone wants to unmute, oh, I don't know if that's going to work out, Guy, but uh, they could, you could throw out, um, throw out uh, any words, any ways that we've done this or, to, or put it into the chat. Yeah, throw your ideas in the chat and then we can see what comes up there. That's good. And then Guy, could you read them out? When they arrive. Yes. Okay. So everyone, everyone take 30 seconds now and think of ways in which we have historically disposed of the deceased. We got burned in, in embalming. Um, Teddy thinks cremation is only very recent, the last 50 years maybe, is cremation disposal at sea. Um, the Viking funeral that's being eaten by the vultures. Um, Anyone else got some thoughts to chip into the chat? Yes, is um yeah, put in the trees for vultures. Um, yeah, let's go back to you. Okay, so just a few images I have to contribute. The, of course, we have the Egyptians and their mummification, and um, an Indian, a, a, a Hindu funeral pyre, a Viking ship on fire. So fire for sure. Mummification, fire, and uh, more contemporary, but but still older uh, First Nations burials. On the left is a is a is a cemetery, um, which which is has become the traditional First Nations. <laughs> and on the right is um, is a is a is a box which was the tradition for the coastal First Nations, um, putting the deceased up in a box in the in the in the air. And then, and then here's an image, just a drawing, but of a of a of a very old civilization burying the deceased in in a in a kind of a a box that they've made in the ground. So all to say that uh, that green burial is is a, is not a new concept. It's an old concept. It's in burying of our loved ones. Basically, it's true. Burying and burning and sty burials have been like our main way of disposing our of our deceased for eternity. And burying has been what we've done. And of course, that's been natural until life became less natural just in the last in the in the recent history. But for eternity, it's it's that has been what we have been one of the main processes that we've been disposing of our deceased. So what are our current disposition options? And there are two, really, two main disposition options in BC. There is cremation, which is fire cremation, and there is burial. So if um, our deceased is cremated, once they're cremated, then there are some options. Then there is a interment or scattering or keeping them on the mantle or, or, or scattering them at sea. And then with a burial, there is conventional burial and there's green burial. And with a conventional burial, um, and I say conventional, not traditional, because conventional is what it's, it, it's is the modern, sort of the modern term. Um, that usually involves a, a deep hole, a six or seven foot hole, and then a grave liner in, in the grave, which is a concrete grave liner that, that completely lines the grave. And then the casket put inside that grave liner. And the casket can be made of, of anything from wood uh, to metals, to plastics, uh, fiberglass, any 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 material that the, the coffin can be made from, put inside that grave liner and then a cap put on top of that. And the cap is either another concrete cap or a, or a fiberglass cap. And then some earth put on top of that. So when you look out at a, at a cemetery, a conventional cemetery, it's, it's green and grassy and there might be some trees, but under the ground, it's, it's, there are all these grave liners and met caskets of metals and plastics and um, all sorts of non-biodegradable materials. And then green burial. So let's turn to green burial. Green burial is, let me make sure this is the right, the next slide. Yeah, green burial is a natural, simple, and beautiful solution for our community and our environment. Green burial is honoring and kind for the deceased. Green burial is beautiful for our senses. It is physical. It is non-dogmatic. It is strikingly real. It is a giving back to nature. 
we have an instinct for green burial, right? We know it. And green burial is fulfilling. So here's an image from one of our first green burials. Um, this is a family and friends carrying the deceased in a shroud. They've carried her in a procession up the hill and this is the grave over to the left and they're carrying her over to the grave. So you see, it's beautiful. It's all those things, it's beautiful and wild. It is striking, like I said. It, um, it, it, it's quite a profound, I'll show you more pictures. It's, it's quite a profound practice. So the tenants, a little bit of the nut, more nuts and bolts, the tenants of green burial are that it's a direct earth burial. So there are no grave liners. Um, there's no caps, there's no fiberglass. It, it's directly in the earth. There's our only biodegradable materials um, that, are, that the deceased is buried in and or placed on top of the earth. So only um, cloth, or wood or wicker as a as a as a vessel placed inside the inside the grave and then on top only stone or wood on top everything biodegradable natural flowers only no embalming is allowed in the green burial cemetery so none of the bodies are embalmed um, the graves are relatively shallow just about three feet deep so that the tree roots can access the nutrients of the body. And also so that we're not digging and digging and digging deep, deep holes into the earth, right? We did basically as shallow as we can to keep, um, you know, to keep any animals out and, um, but yet to, to, to offer dignity to the deceased and, um, and to, let it, to let them decompose naturally. Um, the memorials are all natural and locally sourced. So whether they're stone or cedar markers, they're natural they're, and, and they're local. We use only organic and natural land use management and landscaping practices. So, you know, no herbicides, no chemicals, no pesticides, um, zero scaping. So there's, there's, there's very little watering necessary. And as, as an aspect of green burial, of course, is land protection and conservation and restoration, which, which I will get more into more detail in our own story. But that's a, a, it's an kind of an essential aspect. It's one of the tenets of green burial. Is that what, is what we're doing also, is we're protecting the land and restoring the land to its natural ways. So the availability of green burial in BC you can see here now there are two conservation green burial cemeteries in BC. And um, these are the two conservation green burial cemeteries in BC. My lights are flashing. I hope the power's not going to go. Um, these are actually the only two conservation green burial standalone cemeteries in all of Canada. So not only BC, but on all of Canada uh, is here at the Salt Spring Island Natural Cemetery and on Denman Island at the Denman Island Natural Burial. So the Denman Island Natural Burial is open only to Denman Islanders if you, if you live there or if you own property there. And the Salt Spring Island Natural Cemetery is open to the larger public. There are a number of hybrid green burial cemeteries. So a hybrid green burial cemetery is where a conventional cemetery has made a portion of their cemetery into a green burial. So where they'll do shallower graves and no embalming and only natural materials. And they do, and they do um, wild landscaping, and that's at Woodlands at Royal Oak, which was the first, and really they were the trailblazers. So lots of gratitude for the Woodlands at Royal Oak Burial Park, and also at Nature Grove and Yates Memorial Park in Parksville. There's one at Hillside Cemetery in Chilliwack, and at Heritage Gardens in Surrey. Secondly, now let's move into the story of the Salt Spring Island Natural Cemetery. Now I had prepared, I have a video, a, a six and a half minute video that um, was going to do most of this story for me, but it, when Guy and I practiced it, it didn't, uh, it didn't turn up, it, it didn't play very well. So now I'm kind of winging it <laughs> um, for what the story is. So I'll tell you what the story is, I guess, myself. Um, 
the story begins with, uh, well, with the bit, story begins with this land that, that I live on and with my partner, Gavin Johnston. The land, and I'll, I'll show you some images of that after, but the land is uh, in the Burgoyne Valley in Fulford. It's 83.7 acres. And it's an active working farm called Night Owl Farm. On the land is split zoned. So 70 of the acres are agricultural land, ALR, the Agricultural Land Reserve, and 13.7 of the acres of the land is zoned rural. And so that always um, never set, never, never sat well with Gavin or I, because the rural portion in the valley we live on, on, on both sides of the valley, is starting to be developed. And you know, then it can get it can get traded around so that you can subdivide or you could build or you could do this or that. And we didn't want that to happen. Gavin always had the vision with his land that it was a it was a legacy land, and, and his interest was for it to be as wild as possible and still be. Oh, I um, can't see. All right, carry on. So, um. So we, we came up with the idea of the cemetery and that that would um, support the land, support the long-term interests of the land and, and maybe support the children if they ever took over the land and the interest of the farming. So let me just back up a little bit and tell you about Gavin and I. Uh, Gavin is a biologist by training and uh, for the first part of his working life, he worked as a professional biologist. He did uh, research in the Arctic for many years through the 70s and 80s. And he had a biological consulting company called Northern Biomes Limited. He worked out of uh, Whitehorse in the Yukon. And then the second part of his working life, he, um, he started an uh, Arctic char aquaculture. So, you know, Arctic char you can buy at the grocery store sometimes. He, any Arctic char you buy at the grocery stores in our part of the world is, is, is from the original fish farm that he began. And these are land-based fish farms in tanks. And um, so he's always loved animals. And so he worked with the fish and he started hatcheries as well. So he spent another chunk of his life working, working with the Arctic char. And that was, um, and then he wrote a book called Arctic Char Aquaculture and worked and worked as a consultant all over the world, um, consulting on ar Arctic Char Aquaculture. And then he moved to Salt Spring and, you know, kayaked for a few years and raised his kids. And then he got an itchy, you know, he started to get an itch for something, another project. So he bought this land. And he, his focus on this land, his, his determination was he had been raised on a farm. And so his determination to, was to make a, a, a beautiful place, a, a biodiverse place that wouldn't be developed, that would be full of wildlife and could be a successful small family working farm. So that's what the video says. It's too bad it, you can't, I'll, I'll put it on YouTube and you can watch it because there's some great footage of him talking about his vision, how he grew up in Ontario and land got subdivided and subdivided smaller and smaller. And it was, it was so sad and he, he just didn't want that to happen here. Um, so now I come from the other side of things academically is that I, like Guy introduced me, I, I have a philosophy degree and I studied, you know, psychology and philosophy and liberal arts, and then um, yoga for many years. Um, and uh, although Gavin and I both have um, a, a good, we're both entrepreneurial and have a good business acumen and managing, managing um, you know, s small businesses and, um, and loving the land and farming. I've also been a farmer for, for 20 plus years. So um, together we make a good team and um, we've worked out this project. So, you know, he does the, he does the um, sort of land concept. We both do the work and um, I do, the, I do the, the caregiving with the families and the business side of it. Um, and in this image, you can see that's, that's Gavin in the center and I'm to the left and that's some of our family. <laughs> Here are uh, on the left a couple of the cattle, belted Galloways. On the right, some hay fields in the valley that we, we cut our own hay, and that's one of my horses. There's Sitka. 
And here's um, th this image was to remind me to talk about the wetland restoration that we've done. We've we've done a lot of wetland restoration on the farm with BC Wildlife Federation, and um, we have a biodiversity plan on the land. So there's been there's a lot of been, been a lot of habitat restoration, maintaining the farmland and now maintaining the cemetery. This is a map of the property. So at the at the top is um, the main road. We're on the, we're on the one of the main the main Fulford Ganges Road in Salt Spring, and um, it's a long property. And then at the very bottom of this image is is where the the rural you see the rural zone, and that's the part that we wanted protected. I mean, we wanted the ALR protected, but we do have the Agricultural Land Commission that does a, a pretty decent job of protect protecting agricultural land. So it was really the, the rural zone that we were worried about. Although now with the cemetery on the property, the whole property is has another layer of oversight from um, Consumer Protection BC. Um, it's, it's specified to our activities in the cemetery, but the whole property has on the title a certificate of public interest. And um, this is a picture of uh, what was a machine shed for our tractors. And we always loved this beautiful post and beam shed. And uh, so we've turned it into a gathering place. We closed in the sides and we turned it into a beautiful gathering place. There's a fire pit and people hold ceremonies and parties there now for the cemetery. Okay, so here's a, here's a timeline of the Salt Spring Island Natural Cemetery. We get, began the project concept in the summer of 2018. It began with Gavin saying he would like to be buried here on the, on the, on the land. And I said, I, I, don't, I don't think you're allowed to do that. And that was the beginning of the conversation of how to, how to have a natural cemetery here. And it, it took a year or a little less than a year. And we went through the, the steps and we gained our provincial certificate of public interest. That's the that's the the legal um, steps bureaucracy so that the land is allowed to be um, what's called a place of interment, and then another year and we gained our cemetery operator's license, and then we went wow this is really going to happen and we worked like crazy and um, we developed the land and the buildings and in that spring and 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 summer and autumn. And in that time as well, we gained certification as a conservation green burial cemetery by the Green Burial Society of Canada. And then we opened for our first burial in autumn of 2020, which is just coming up to our second anniversary. I think it was November 2nd of uh, 2020 was our first burial. And then as of autumn, as of that burial, autumn of 2022, uh, uh, yeah, as of now then, we've buried 40 people in the cemetery. Those are not all full burials. Oh, I, I'm going to get to that. And we pre-sold pre another 70 spots. So of the of those 40 people that we've buried, a, about one third are uh, the cremated remains. So that's either an interment of cremated remains or scattering of cremated remains, mostly interments. And then two thirds are full body burials. So thirdly now, and please, if you have any questions um, about specific to our cemetery, just, just put it in the chat or, or write it down or make a mental note and we can go back to that. Um, what is a green burial funeral like? Um, so the, on Salt Spring, the green burial, the, all, the, all the green burial funerals pretty much begin with these Myself and these people, and these, these women are our funeral directors on Salt Spring. There's three of them. Hannah's in there twice. It's Hannah and Lindsay and, and Christy Doyle is in the white shirt. And Christy Doyle owns the funeral home on Salt Spring. So these three women um, are, are wonderful to work with. They're, they're not corporate. They're all women. They're all moms. We have, we have a great working relationship. And I feel like we couldn't do what we do do without them. Um, so uh, the, the deceased, someone dies and these wonderful women pick them up day or night, in the middle of the night usually, 
It's like babies are born at night and people die at night. And they pick them up from the hospital or from home and, um, or from off island. And um, they take them there to the funeral home. And then a few days later or a month later, even, they bring them down to the, to the natural cemetery. And the funeral directors are in attendance and like me as well, they're ready to help in whatever way the family needs. They can be quite standoffish or they can be quite involved, whatever is needed. They're, they're like, we're all the servants to the family and to the process and for it being peaceful and, and uh, healing and, and kind and beautiful. Uh, here is a, a summer uh, funeral. This is a circle of friends and family. Um, one of their mothers had passed away and um, she brought her from Vancouver. The funeral directors went and, and picked her up and brought her over and they all came over some. The two on the right friends flew in from Hawaii for the, for the burial. And um, this is the woman in the denim dress is a, is a um, Anglican minister from Vancouver from Christ Church Cathedral. And um, she came in. And they had a beautiful circle down below in, in the forest. And then they went up the hill, which I'll show you. This is an, another pre-burial circle down below. This is in the gathering place. You can see it's colder. We have, a, we have a fire going. We have stumps that people can sit on. And you can see uh, the deceased is actually in a, in a shroud in the wicker tray there in the middle of the frame. People are sharing their stories and their love, and then they will uh, carry him up the uh, hill. Now, Guy, do you want to try to see if this could play this video? The same one. No, this is just this procession. Um, let's try it. Yeah. Okay. Try it. okay. You might all have to turn up your volume because it's so beautiful. Is it working? Well, they're slowly moving up the hills in jerks, but they're going up the hill. <laughs> Doesn't the jerks don't matter? They're making slow progress. Yes. Is the the volume's turned up? There's no volume at all. It's going to come. Okay. So she's just arriving at the stump as we see it. And now the body is passing the stump. The deceased is passing the stump, I should say. I see the squeeze box, but I hear no music coming yet. Oh, well, anyways, I will. That's part of the video with, with Gavin. And um, this this man with the squeeze box, according, he's, he's singing and playing Hallelujah. Uh, it is it's so beautiful. Mm. And when you get a chance, you have to, and everyone here has okayed that it's it's for public viewing. Um, it, it's, it's just beautiful and it captures it. You have to watch it a few times. It just captures the, the, the beauty and the, the, the sort of the simplicity and the beauty of, yeah. of this procession that comes up the hill. So they come up the hill. We also have a little electric cart. If people aren't able to carry the deceased up, I, I drive them up on this little cart to the hill. And then the, now that we, we, can't see, we can't see the cart yet. You're still on the we video. We don't see the cart. There's no, actually, there's no photos of the cart. Okay, then. But the next image, now I'm just going to check. The next image, I just want to give you a trigger warning because the next image is going to show three graves with um, one with a, two with caskets and one with a shrouded body in the grave. Okay? Yep. Nope. There no, we go. The video is <laughs> starting again. You know, you need to. Now you've got the graves? Not yet. They were still stuck okay. in. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Yes. Okay. So this this is this is the scope of it, really, that we've seen. On the on the left, of course, is a is a wooden casket. In the middle is a shrouded body, which is which is which is quite striking, quite intense, I find. And on the right is a is a wicker woven casket or basket. <laughs> So you can see that the graves are not all that deep, which sometimes is a bit shocking for people. 
um, we line them with cedar boughs or with sword fern fronds. And I usually make kind of a frame around them as well. And the family usually brings flowers. Um, and so the film, I don't have any, you know, I, I don't have too many photos of actual people in these because most people, you know, don't want their photos to be shared. I, I don't, I don't usually ask. Um, so often the, you know, the family and the friends will circle around the grave and then there'll be a pause and then there'll be a lowering. That's the actual interment is the lowering into the grave and then uh, an offering of a flower and some words of love. Um, or, you know, words of anything. It doesn't have to only be love. It can be, I mean, I don't know about all of you, but I, I know my father's uh, funeral, there were all sorts of words. I mean, there were words like, I loved that man and he drove me crazy. Um, you know, I loved him and he was hard to deal with at times. Like it was, my dad's funeral was very real in that way. And that really, that really struck me. And, I, and I've seen some of that at the cemetery for sure, but um, it's, it's an opportunity to, to, uh, to really acknowledge the person and to love them. And I think maybe people that choose Green Burial are more really loving them in their wholeness, in, in, in their whole being, in their whole personality, whatever that is and however that showed up on earth, yeah? So that's what we do. And then the flowers or, or ferns or branches are put on top and, and then uh, either the family fills it in. I usually, I mean, I always leave some shovels and trowels up. Uh, the, the soil is right next to the grave. You just don't see it in these pictures, but sometimes the family begins with a few shovelfuls and then, and then a number of times now they've just kept going and kept going and kept going and eventually it's, it's filled in. And, and that's incredible when that happens, you know, it, it, it's, there happen to be some strong people or they just get into it. And, and that's, it can be very cathartic, you know, if that's, if, if, if you're a worker and then that's really what moves you, that's beautiful. Um, and then other, or otherwise, uh, Gavin will come up later and, and fill it in either by hand or with the machine. And then on top of the grave, we, you, I asked them to leave some flowers out. We, we put some flowers on the top of the grave or some, also some, some sword fern fronds. Um, and then, um, oh yeah, and here's an image of a, of a cremation interment. It's fuzzy so that their faces are, are, are not so clear. Uh, for privacy. Um, cremation interments are a little bit of a debate in the green burial world because um, it's still involved with cremation. Um, but, uh, you know, by purchasing a plot, a cremation plot in the cemetery, they're contributing, the family is, is contributing to the preservation of the land. Um, and, and I personally, I think it's really important to not uh, you know, to be open to people's choices, to not judge people's choices. Uh, we make choices, we make the choice of cremation or burial for all sorts of reasons, you know, for practical reasons, for visceral reasons, for tradition, you know, our family, for, um, yeah, and, and, and that, it, it's all, it's all okay. So, so cremation burials uh, can be easily hand up. And that also, though some of them are closer to those cedar trees because they can be right into the cedar trees because we can just dig around the roots. So that that's also really quite nice. And and here you see the family is there, and this is the widow, and she's she's filling in. She's they all took turns filling in that grave. This was this was really beautiful. And then after the interment, the the family and friends usually come down the hill and then there's another gathering, a less formal gathering, you know, informal gathering. And often they're having food and drinks and the fire is going and they're socializing and sharing stories, maybe sharing music, you know, anything goes. Um, sometimes people bring some, um, some objects of the deceased, you know, like in this picture, um, I think what, what was brought was uh, crystal glassware that, that the woman had cherished. There's also been brought scarves or art that the people have made. And then the attendees are welcome to, to take something with them. And then they have a memento of, of, their, of their friend. And um, that's, it's been, that's really a really nice practice. It's been quite sweet. Um, and here are three images of our 
of the stones, the headstones, the memorial markers. So while uh, all of the stones are, our land is full of field stones like this. Uh, we have a we have a, a quarry that um, we we can pull these out of, and also we make gravel for the roads. So we because we, we we try to be as self sufficient on the land as we can, and the, the the quarry is a part of that. So we pull out stones, and also there's just stones all over. You just dig a hole for a tree, and there's a stone. <laughs> so um, we pull ones out that are that are will be usable as a headstone. They have to be about 18 inches across and have a relatively flat face. And then we work. I work with a, uh, an engraver in Saanich called Carl Hughes. And he, with through me, with the family, comes up with a design and um, and they okay it. And then he comes out and he has a mobile sandblasting and he sandblasts it on the rocks. And it, it as you can see, it, it, there's some variation and, and it's, it's turning out just beautifully. I'm really, really happy with the stones. Uh, there we have it. So if there's, I don't know if you want to do questions and discussion now or later, Guy. I think now would be good, yeah, if you want to um, stop the sharing thing. Okay, there's just one more page, and that is the resources, but maybe we just yes. want to put those well, in the talk, chat. Talk us through those first. Okay, um, so the first is our the Salt Spring Island National Cemetery website, saltspringnaturalcemetery.ca, and then Green Burial Canada, that's the Green Burial Society of Canada. There, there are, I'm also a board member of the Green Burial Society. And then the greenburialcouncil.org, the third one is the American Green Burial Association. And um, it's an excellent resource. Their website is great. There's a lot of information on their website. And then lastly is the Conservation Burial Alliance, which is a, 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 a kind of an offshoot of the American Green Burial Council. It's specific to the conservation burial groups. There's a, lot, there's a lot more resources. I just thought I'd keep it kind of simple and to those main ones. Great. So if you want to stop sharing, we got um, five questions in the chat lined up. And okay. so let me, where do we start here? Um, we've got Alison Vardy asking, what access do family have to visit the site later? And what legal status or land ensures that it will be perpetual? Great. Uh, so the cemetery is open every day from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And people can come and go as they like. Um, I, I do get a lot of people asking about that. So I, you know, we, I, I try to put out that out on the website and it's also on a sign as you drive up our lane, but it definitely, because you do drive by our home and you drive through the farm. So I'm not sure if that, if people feel like they're not sure if they should come in. So I, I have, I do say over and over again, yes, you're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome, anytime between nine and six. And nine and six is just kind of an average, right? I mean, in the summer, it's a beautiful summer evening, a family could come later, that's fine. In the winter, you know, kind of like dawn to dark. And because we have to be lighthearted, on Halloween, do you welcome midnight visits? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm a little bit nervous about this Halloween, actually. <laughs> I'm really trying to like not do the Halloween thing. Like we are okay. not, we do not have ghosts and ghouls here, right? This is okay, not that. Let's move on. So <laughs> Ad Adrian Brown is asking, how much does a typical green burial cost, not including service? Well, actually, let's just go. I didn't finish that. Somebody, the, that same person asked about um, the legal status of the land. Alison Barty, right? Ask what legal status is, is, is land. Adrian, or the, yeah, do the legal status of the land first. Alison's question, that one, right? Yes. What legal? So, um, okay. So that was what I kind of jumbled through with the with the chronology. Is the uh, so a cemetery in the provincial legislation is called a place of interment, not internment, but interment, and that means to to bury, right? To put in the earth. So a place that we do that. And so uh, we are a legal place of interment. The South Spring and Nacho Cemetery is. You have to be that. You can't bury anywhere in BC except for in a place of interment. And the provincial government oversees a place of interment. So to have a place of interment, the, the land needs to have on it what's called a certificate of public interest. So that means even if the land is privately owned, like our land is privately owned, there's a, a certificate of public interest on the land. So the provincial government has 
um, the public's interest on this, the title of this land. So things can't happen. We can't just do anything we want now, which, uh, which we were actually happy about. <laughs> you, 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 we, you know, like it, 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 uh, it, a lot of private owners, you know, want complete authority. And um, we actually wanted to step back and, and pass that out for, for the public. That was the interest in protecting the land. So um, before, before we make new roads or before we make buildings, we have to not only check with the Agricultural Land Commission, not only check with the Capital Regional District and on and on, we also have to check with Consumer Protection BC who oversees places of internment. So that is forever on the that is forever on the title of this property. Now, secondly, that um, what all places of internment have to have are a perpetual care fund. So a quarter a quarter of all the money that we bring in for the graves for the right of internment goes into a perpetual care fund trust, and this is also mandated by the legislation and the provincial legislation, and that is held in perpetuity. So we never see that money. It goes into a trust fund and it can eventually, the interest that that money makes can be drawn on for the care and the maintenance of the cemetery. So when the cemetery is no longer generating uh, income, then that interest can be accessed to, you know, take care of the memorial stones, to keep the road clear, to keep the, the leaves raked as needed. So it's 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 great, and this is all legislated provincially. So any sem any newer cemetery has these um, um, safeguards that they will always be a cemetery and always be cared for. Okay, good. So Adrienne yes was asking, what does a typical green burial cost, not including um, a funeral service? Well, uh, there's a number of costs to it. I mean, simply a grave. I was going to put up our schedule of rates, but I didn't do that. But I thought of that. Simply. The grave costs forty five hundred dollars, um, and that can be pre purchased, and that would always be the price, or it can be bought at the time. And then there is a fee at the time of the burial. There's a fee for the digging of the grave, which I, I wonder about the excavator's partner. <laughs> but it's nine hundred dollars to dig the to to prepare the grave, and then there's the cost of the stone, which varies, but it's it's a it's about eight hundred dollars or so after with the engraving. Basically, it's the cost of the engraving, and then it's. It, I mean, and then there are the funeral services as well. So there's this. There's the funeral director, which doesn't come through us. There's a funeral director, picks picks up the person, drives the person, uh, does the make you know um, registers the death. So there are, I mean, there are a number, there are a lot of costs involved in death. And, and, it, and if you've never looked into that, some people are, are often surprised at the cost of death because it's like we go from, a lot of people go from being in the hospital and getting incredible care in the hospital, you know, completely covered by MSP. And then you're out the door, you know, you die, you're out the door and, and, and there's nothing's covered. It's all, it's all out of your pocket. Unless you're low, you, you know, unless you, you, you meet the thresholds, um, the ministry thresholds, um, then the Ministry of um, Social Development and Poverty Reduction, then they do pay for um, the burials. And if it's been your expressed interest, if you've written down that you want a green burial, then the ministry will pay our fees for, for a, a green burial cemetery, a green burial Green Barrett. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Adrian's also got a very practical question. What happens to pacemakers, dental fillings, and joint replacements, etc., in a green burial? Yeah, they they are left in. And uh I think honestly, I mean, I I mean they have to go somewhere in in, in they go somewhere. And so they 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 they're left in the bodies. We don't okay, you know, and people have also asked about, you know, what if you're receiving chemotherapy and have those chemicals in your body. That, that that there's no the only limit in that way is that there's no embalming, um, and, and I take it like it has to go that you know all the all that junk has to go somewhere, and so we get a little bit of that, um, but I think that the earth can handle it here, and 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 also I imagine what I imagine is you know in three thousand years when the archaeologists come and dig us up, then they'll find that stuff. I mean we want to leave something that's interesting for them, then they can see that and they're like oh this is what these people were doing then. Yeah. <laughs> So Keona Wiley is asking, how close can you bury to a tree trunk? And secondly, do you allow people to plant native trees on top of the body? 
so we don't do full burials. Like, you, you know, we basically, we watch the drip line of the branches and we, and we don't do burials too many. We don't, you, you can do one or two within the drip line of the burial because I, what I'm saying about the drip line of branches, that's basically simply that's as far as the roots go. Um, so we, that's our plan is we have stands of trees and then we have, there were naturally in the forest where we're burying, there were openings and it's in the openings where we have the, the little graveyards for about 40 people. And then there's a stand of, of five or six uh, Douglas firs and maples. And then there's another little opening. And so it's in those openings that we've got the graveyards. And um, so we don't, we don't bury, um, we don't bury basically within the drip lines. And except for we can do some cremation burials because then we can start to dig and if we come to roots, we just go around them. That, that's quite been quite simple. So does that mean, it's a question from me here, that when you analyze your forest as a whole, you know what your limited total numbers is of how many people you can bury in those areas between the drip lines? Yes, we do. So at some point you'll need to close the, the cemetery down. Apart from yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm and like I say to people, we're not really some people ask about that or ask about double depths and, and we're not trying to maximize here. I mean, we have 13.7 acres that is all the place of interment, but we're only really going to use an acre and a half of it, probably, but it's all protected because it's all the cemetery. Yeah. So um so that that's and then what will happen when that's full or when there, it's no we, we can't bury anymore, then then we can hopefully there'll be some other land on Salt Spring that yeah. we could that we can. You know, right? Yeah. Um, so, but there was one. Oh, the native trees on top of on top of the bodies. Yes. Um, yeah. We have a few. Sorry, guy. No, go ahead. That's the question. Can you plant native yeah. trees on top of the body? We be, because we already. Um, and this is when the questionnaire that you sent out, right? We we already have, and it's an existing second growth forest. So the, 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 the firs especially are what we are imagining that we're really growing and they're 80 to 100 years old. So, so they're, they're, you know, they're a good hugging kind of size, single person hugs, pretty decent, big, tall firs. Um, and they'll be, they'll be the, the ones that will grow for hundreds of years. Yeah. Um, so, you know, those are really our trees. Like those are the trees that, that, um, that we're feeding. So we, we've, got, we've got the graves in, in the openings and then the roots of those firs and the maples too are gonna come or maybe already have come down into the graves once, they're, once, once the people are buried, they're coming into the graves and then we're feeding those trees. So we've planted a, we've planted a couple trees inside that, but it's not, it's, it's like the trees are already there and we're nourishing those trees. What we are doing and what we've committed to do is, is plant a tree, for, at, at least one tree for every burial, but elsewhere on the land where further, further around that, we, we didn't really see the photo of the pond, but there's a wetland and there's quite a few ponds and we're, we're, we're restoring a, a, a Gary Oak habitat that's in a much more open, less dense uh, forested place. And we're planting trees in honor of the, the people that we've buried out there. Yeah. But it's it's not really practical or even good forest management to plant a single tree on top of every grave. Sure. So and Adrian, I know that's hard for you. <laughs> Adrian's also looking to the future. I'm sure you know about the the acclimation process that's not yet allowed in BC on um, alkaline hydrolysis or AH. Do you know about acclimation? Can you tell people what it is and where, if it might be allowed, would you be using that in future at Salt Spring? Um, that is not my interest. I mean, I'm all about green burial. I feel like it's like, um, um, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's a little bit, I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of you drive electric cars and electric cars are great, but it's a bit like replacing the, the, the fossil fuel car with the electric car. You know, like it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's maybe a bit better. Like you can trade it off and there's pros and cons, but green burial is like, I'm just going to walk to the store instead. Yeah. Right. Fine. I just walk there and it's right there and I can get there and I don't need a vehicle to take me there. Right. And it's not only, not only, I mean, it's not only like it's, it's, it's better for the environment, like um, a choice of, of, um, of, of, of cleaner gas or less clean glass, it's it's actually a positive contribution. I mean, we're actually nourishing, we're actually feeding trees and protecting land. So it's not, it's just not really, the acclimation is not really my conversation. Okay. Um, 
So that was the there's no more questions in the um in the chat. Does anyone want to raise their hand or just I'm gonna change to full gallery view and does anyone got other questions they want to ask right now while the opportunity is here? Um if not, stay with us, Kathy, because we're um one of someone asked if you those are four resources. If you could put them in the chat, then people can catch them easily. And I'm gonna invite Pamela to sure. tell us what we're doing in the Yellow Point Ecological Society to explore the possibilities for a similar green burial cemetery locally. Pamela, do you want to tell people what's happening? Thanks so much, Guy. Yes, and thank you, Kathy, for a very interesting chat. Um, we at the Yellow Point Ecological Society have been sitting around trying to figure out how we can protect land, um, just as you are trying to do that with your own land, um, Kathy. But we're thinking around our area, how do we do that? Um, we have no money. We had a, a there was a 60 acre piece of property that was, had gorgeous second growth trees on it. And that's why Yellow Point Ecological Society was uh, formed in the first place, because we wanted to save that piece of land. It connected, uh, there was wetlands through it, it connected to parks, it, it was pristine, it was gorgeous, and it got decimated, logged the entire thing through the wetlands, through the riparian zones, everything is gone. And we're, we want to know how we can um, stop that from happening again. And somebody came up with this idea, same as you did, Kathy, just lay a body in it like um, President Trump did with his former president Trump did with his um, former wife at Mar-a-Lago and that land is saved. Um, so what we did to see whether this was a viable option or not was went to uh, Vancouver Island University and asked whether there would be an MBA student who could do uh, a project for us to see whether it would, was feasible. We hired a young man named Mayank Sani. I think he's on yes. uh, the Zoom My here. Mayank, do you want to chime in and tell us a little bit about... Hi, Mayank. And he has just about finished his, uh, his report, which says kind of exactly what we thought, that we can't do this unless somebody else... Um, donates the land for us. It's not viable with the, the price of land as it is. So I think that's what his report says. We'll find out as soon as we we get it in, in its completion um, in a couple of days. Yes. So, but in the meantime, we've done some research and there's lots of people out there that have been looking at it or are looking at, at this screen burial, um, realizing that we want to be ecologists for the rest of our natural lives and and afterwards as well. Why can't we continue with this progress? So we're looking into it. We need more help with this. Um, we need more ideas. Um, I did talk to Kathy and say, Kathy, if we did happen to find this piece of land, <laughs> We're not in the funeral business, as she is not, um, but we're not even in the, the cemetery business either. Kathy, would you be willing to manage it as a business for us if we did find such land? And Kathy said she'd think about it. Oh. And, <laughs> and then she said, yes, that, you know, they probably could do that for us. So I don't know, all we need is somebody who, to give us 10 acres of land that has, you know, possibility, it has some trees still left on it and maybe a little parking spot for, for people to come visit. And we've got tons of people that have would sign up today. <laughs> so let, let me rephrase that. We don't need anyone to give us the land. We need someone who might be willing to donate their own land and keep ownership over it. It doesn't really matter who owns it. True. Um, That's it, true. It, it, a lot of us around Yellow Point have acreage. And if someone's having acreage and thinking of a way to preserve it, then, you know, we want to inspire the conversation and to think about the friends you have who have land as well. 
And um, Kathy, how many acres have you got totally for the, the cemetery? 13.7. Yeah, 13, that's, that's not a great big number. It's, it's manageable. No. Yeah. It is contiguous with uh, Burgoyne Bay Provincial Park. I mean, there are some benefits that also make it, um, um, you, you know, have greater value, which, which would be a good thing to try to look for as well. I mean, although, although, you know, any land. You, you want to have road frontage if possible. Ours doesn't have that. And that was a big, that was a real challenge. So if road frontage would be, would be ideal. So people have to drive all the way through your farm to get to it, right? So yeah, and that's, it's fine with us, but consumer protection, I mean, when we almost had our license through, they, a new director came in and said, uh, -uh forget it. They have to subdivide. And then uh, we, we actually at that point we hired a lawyer a really good like a 70 year old litigation lawyer and he wrote this great letter really like this is the whole concept is this and da, 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 da. and so then they 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 let it through they let us do it but it's not their first choice for sure road frontage is best so so kiona is asking what about wildwood and i think wildwood have said their goal is ecoforestry and this is not really their main focus and Wildwood is not threatened either. This Wildwood is safe because it's owned by a nonprofit um, ecoforestry trust. And then Sharon's asking, could a regional park become a green burial site? And in partial answer to that, on Denman, the, the Denman Green Burial Cemetery was actually part of a conservation area bit of land that had been, I'm not sure what kind of park status it is, but there was an area that had been clear cut at one end that needed to be recovered. So the Conservation Society allowed the Green Burial team to use that to set up their Green Burial site and they're now restoring it. They're planting native trees throughout what was a clear cut and making sure the deer don't eat them. And um, that's how they're doing it on, on Denman, yeah. But the thing with the park, I just saying it's pretty well protected as it is. This yeah. idea was for other land that isn't protected. Um, we have one, thought that it might be easier if we got a piece of land that was already clear cut. Um, but that seems a bit difficult because how far do we want to go in our ecological <laughs> um, striving to, to do this? Uh, I mean, it's going to take a long time to, like you said, Kathy, you've got um, mature trees. If we're in a clear cut, our bodies are in a clear cut with yes, a, a, a little tiny sapling stuck on top of us. It's going to take a long time and who wants to come and visit us? <laughs> so it doesn't sound as appealing, but. Yeah. So we're putting the thought out there. If you have friends or you know someone who has forest who might be willing to think about this as a, a way to preserve that forest. But but more than that, from listen, Kathy, I listened to you on, on, on CBC radio on Sunday morning when you were talking with the death doula. And you made a big point about how it's about the family's need to have a place for commemoration for a spiritual gathering around that, which could be still happening in 100 years time. Do you want to speak to your thoughts around that? So you were very eloquent on Sunday morning. You're muted, by the way, Kathy. Yeah. The, um, I think when she had asked me that, um, she had asked me that just after we had um, a, a memorial, this group of people yeah, I mean, I, I think when I talk about the Green Burial Funerals, I didn't, it, it's hard to really capture it, but it is, it is, it is so beautiful. And we'd, we'd had this memorial of this young man who had died. Um, he was 36 and he was uh, he, he, just a, a, a beautiful, love, love, loving, artistic man. The story is that every, every guy that he was friends with thought that he was his best friend and every woman who knew him thought that she was the love of his life. Right? So he was like that. And he died young and, and passionately. And, um, and they have had a number of gatherings for him. And they had a memorial that they spent, they had an evening at a hall nearby where they read poems and they did all this. And then the next day, he's like our Jim Morrison, right? You know, at the Père Lachaise in, 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 in Paris, he, people come, but this was especially, they came all that day. They put all the flowers from the altar on top of his grave and they sat there and, you know, they, they contemplated and then they laughed and they had a few drinks and they ate food and they poured some, you know, scotch on his grave. Like the whole, they just did the whole thing. It was so beautiful in all the wackiness that it was, right? Like the, it, it, 
the cemetery can just hold that. And I really think, and I thought, I, I walked by a few times just to see that they were okay and everything was okay and the fire, there wasn't a fire. And um, I thought, it just struck me that how courageous they were, you know, that they were showing up for this person. Now it's been more than a year that he's passed and they keep showing up for him. And that they, courageous in that they are willing to feel his loss over and over again they're willing to feel his contributions and his love and the loss of him and how sad that is and also how beautiful that is that they that they knew him and loved him and um and i i mean that to me really i thought wow that's what we need right like we that 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 connection to our ancestors the connection to our loved ones the connection to history right we're such a moment to moment culture that we've forgotten about all that we you know like that even all of this is going on in the world right now with in with with russia and ukraine right it's like this is that we just replay over and over the mistakes of the past right so so i i mean i do believe philosophically that the that remembering our ancestors keeps us wiser and keeps us more soul connected as people and not just you know moment to moment and on our devices and with our stuff but really with the, the, the essence of life and and I believe I, <laughs> that a cemetery is an essential part of that, that that that's a place that we go to that are that are deceased aren't only in our memories and 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 aren't even really that's what I said on that that they're not also that we don't keep them in our home that we 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 take the deceased from our daily life and 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 we honorably put them in the earth or in a cemetery and then we go in and we and we pay tribute to them there i i think it's yeah. important <laughs> another possibility because here in yellow point we're, we're still seeking that piece of land is that some people in their wills if they you know they want to will their land to the public good they could um how if they wanted to will it to become a cemetery would they need to what would they write in the will if, if there's no existing organization that's it though they could write it to the yellow point ecological society with a big message saying this is for purposes as a cemetery if it can be achieved something like that yeah i think that it would be ideal if that was set up you can set it up like a trust and it's set up um before they die and that once they die, I forget the exact name of the trust, but once they die, then it it, re, it re becomes a, a trust in the name of the Yellow Point Society. Actually, that 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 isn't that difficult to do. No. Uh, just listening to you talking, listening to you talking, I'm really quite moved. I won't say emotionally, but I say spiritually about the thought of the the that continuing presence in the forest, sharing in that beauty and the ceremony, and how I know there's there's got to be a lot of people living around Yellow Point who feel they'd like to be part of that continuing harmony because people that love it people who live around here love it same as people on salt spring love salt spring yeah teddy's saying and you know what it's not it's not so much a place of death it is a place of life yes it's amazing you know you go to the cemetery and you see the trees and you see everything happening and you really feel life you don't feel death it's 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 like an oxymoron but it, it really is true yeah so alison vardy is saying i think we know our green barrels the same as composting bodies and that body's going to compost yeah. under the ground right yeah yeah so, exactly people ask me about the composting and i say you know you could go to you could go to home home depot and you could buy like a, a fancy black composter that is like you plug it in and it turns your compost for you or you could dig a hole in your backyard and you could put your compost in there and you could turn it with a shovel right like it's like you don't need a fancy a contraption to compost so kathy you, you probably know how up the the research around the the, the fish and the trees and the bears that the fish catch the salmon, drag them into the forest, and the remains of the salmon get picked up by the roots of the tree and taken up into the tree. Same is going to be true with us. Mm -hmm. So if the roots of the tree come into the body, our remnants are going to be part of that tree, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know what? That, that beautiful man that was buried that had the memorial, he is one person that we planted, that his, his friends planted a dogwood on top of his grave. They, we said, no, 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 and they begged and begged and they were so sad. So we, we let them plant a, a dogwood and I planted a dogwood just outside my window here only a couple months later than that. And they're not exactly the same environments, but I'll tell you that dogwood in the cemetery is twice as tall and twice as full as the one outside my window here. 
Teddy is saying he read about read he read about um composting recently. He says composting bodies actually not legal in BC, but it happens in dedicated facilities. And then the soil is given to the family. And Suzanne Devo says that Irene Windlow has just passed away recently, and they have a lot of land there. So her husband Keith may be open to this thought. And Keona is saying that is the same in any cemetery. They're all places to honor and commemorate those who we've loved and lost. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Places of love. Yeah, like we, I mean, go, go visit your loved ones everywhere where they are. Yeah, I mean, my my brother-in-law just died in Vancouver, and and my sister, she wanted to bring him here. I said, no, he spent his life in Vancouver. He should be in the cemetery in Vancouver. You know, we that's you don't want hungry ghosts. You want to keep them there. And so exactly, all cemeteries are that. I mean, it's 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 this it's a it's a beautiful community place. So let me open this up and turn your cameras on if you want to, so we can see each other. And I'm sure this is, I'm sure people have got thoughts they would be, might be willing to share at this moment without turning into a total sort of <laughs> crazy fest. But um, you, have, you have thoughts in your hearts. I know that. Feel free to share them with us. Don't all be shy. Yes, Suzanne, go ahead. You're, you unmute yourself. Um. Years ago, I worked uh, for Telford and uh, Cedar Valley Memorial in uh, basically the pre-booking of, right, before pre-arrangements. And uh, what an industry. Oh, whew. it's, uh, mm. <laughs> I, I really, I enjoyed the small independent companies a lot more than the bigger companies. Um, it seemed the larger the company, the more, um, you know, uh, hey, let's sell you this, let's sell you that. And um, and at the time of the most hard emotional need. Um, the other thing that uh, people don't know in, when she talked about just basic body disposition. So it's the same service. It's basically preparing the body, the, the death certificate, getting it ready. And uh, let's just say if it was all cremation, it goes from at that point, it was $800 for someone like Telford or Yates. It was $1,500 for uh, the Mid Island. And then Cedar Valley at the time was $2,500. So people that are really stretched financially, they don't know that. They just walk in and think it's all the same. So um, it, that's something to, to think about too, to, to support the, the local independents. Yeah. And, and and people on low incomes, you know, they they is, they should have an absolute right to the same beauty in dying as millionaires. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, Kathy. Yeah. Um, and to that, Suzanne, thank you. It's, and it's true about the low income is people should know that if um, if you have a sibling, say, who who dies, who is low income. Um, the family doesn't have, I mean, this might sound cold, but I, I just want you to know the nuts and bolts of it. The family is not required, like if they're on, if they're on a long-term disability or social assistance, ministry will pay for it. And they do a decent job at paying for it. Like I said, they'll pay for a burial here or anywhere. They'll pay for what you want or what the person wanted. The family doesn't have to everybody pitch in and pay for it. it, it the ministry is there, is there to do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's uh, they don't they don't advertise that, but it, it is it they it is yeah. right. Anyone else have thoughts they'd like to share before we um I have something I'd like to share. Go ahead, Carolyn. Yeah. Um I was actually really shocked um, to see that slide of the grave with the casket in it, which you then I didn't know this uh, new information told us that it was lined with concrete or cement or something. And uh, when I tuned into that, like I feel as a person who's tried to live as natural a life as possible, I just got a, a whole thing of horror that just went right through my body because it felt so unnatural to think that I came into this world cell by cell and I actually intend to leave it cell by cell by decomposing in a natural method but that, that people in general will go to all that trouble and all that expense to end their lives, their day um, on this earth in a box or a casket of something which is like wasted resources, that's going to sit there in a lined grave, which is actually counterintuitive because it um, stops the breaking down and the decomposing and the amalgamation of one's um, physical being into the 
earth and um so that I just wanted to share that that I learned something that there is absolutely no way that I will I, I um, want do, do not want to be cremated I want to be buried but I do not want to be buried in this way thanks Carolyn Genevieve do you want to turn your camera on and unmute yourself and share your thoughts um, I can't I can't share my camera right now but I do want to uh, share my thoughts on a couple of things. One is um, attending um, a number of Couch and Tribes um, mem uh, funerals is I've been very moved with how the uh, graves are, are hand dug by um, a, a grouping of people that have been uh, doing that for some time before. There's no machinery. And the other th piece has been the, um, as Kathy mentioned, the throwing in of soil um, with a shovel full has been brought to me a, a different way of managing my grief at these gatherings and the same with um, Jewish memorials and one other I've been to um, an Anglican one where we all if we chose to could um, could fill the grave and that has been such a different experience than um, memorials in um, my earlier life um, so I want I wanted to uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk about that, the physicality of doing that. And so I appreciate Kathy bringing that forward. And in terms of, um, there was something else I wanted to mention. My, my friend who's a rabbi in Victoria, Lynn Greenoff, uh, talked to me beforehand before my mom-in-law died in our home. And it brought me to a different process of, I did this on my own, was washing my, my mom-in-law's body myself and dressing her in that before the um, people came to take her away. And that also, um, I believe was a very powerful way of me dealing with my grief in a very concrete hands-on literally way. So just wanted to bring those thoughts forward. And in North Cowichan, as a community, we are exploring changes to our, um, our local graveyard and a green burial is something that is on the table and I'm just really appreciative as I know other people are on this call that this presentation is here because it's really helping um, us learn more and my only other I hadn't heard of salt the salt spring one before was I've been in conversation with people in Royal Oak who have been very helpful but this is this is fantastic so thank you Yellow Point and thanks Kara, Kathy. Thanks Genevieve. Um, right, anyone else? Oh. Yes, we've got hands going up here. Um, Pam, again. Yes, you're muted. Yes, I just had a, another revelation that I had studying this. Um, I had always thought that cremation was um, probably the best ecologically sound way to um, dispose of your body because it, you know, it goes comes into a smaller package. Um, I had no idea, I didn't think about all the greenhouse gases that are used um, to put the furnace up to, what is it, 1400 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius, I don't know, I don't know, some big huge number. And um, that really surprised me too. So, and it's interesting that so many people are being cremated these days. How, how has the funeral um, business usurped us and how ha have they how have they taken all the power when my sister-in-law was recently in um in the hospital uh, emergency and ended up there we really had no choice it seemed to me she she was in emergency care and then she wasn't and then she was gone and and we didn't really have time to think about it. So that's one thing that is really important that we probably all do now is, is think about what we want, our final wishes. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Suzanne, another thought? Before? Yeah, another thought. Um, I, I looked on the RDN and Ben Jesselbrick, who who's gotten in as a counselor again, and the plan for access and parks uh, where close to where I live on the Nanaimo River because some lo lots have been bought up and basically a lot of people come here and it doesn't cost you anything to go down to the river. It's beautiful. And so they have a big plan to make some beautiful large parks that will actually give access to the river. And there, there's a lot of acreage. 
I wonder if a portion of that could be for the great, like it would be a beautiful spot. The trees are gorgeous. The river's there. Like, you know, maybe it, it could be a portion of that piece. So Ben might be a good person to talk to you about that. Thanks. Did you, um, we, we issued a, a questionnaire earlier. If you, if you go to Bottom Sea Reactions, you can put up your hand like that. And that says that um, you answer the questionnaire. How many of you, this is a quiz time now, how many of you actually completed our natural burial questionnaire? Um, one. Well, if then we will, re we have the emails for everyone who came here. We'll send you that questionnaire because it's asking, it's giving us information to help us with our planning and how we approach this. Um, we had some 40 people complete that. Um, Nikki's done it, yes. And Nikki's cat has probably done it too. <laughs> um, anything else we need, Pamela? Do anything else? Um, Brian's done it. We need to wrap up, Pamela. Is there anything else to cover tonight before we finish? You're muted. Your pearls of wisdom are. <laughs> Sorry, I just I just want to thank Kathy for um, what she did and what she's doing. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's Kathy. So let's let's wind up. And um, if you use your reaction buttons, we can all thank Kathy in that kind of way. And we can also it's because it, you're being a you're being a leader. You're you're showing the way. You're making it so much easier for everyone else. This word is spreading all over the place. And we're really grateful that you've taken this time on an evening to do this. Thank you very much. Um, this recording will be, when, as soon as available, we'll send it to everyone who came this evening and for everyone who signed up and we'll send you our little questionnaire as well. And we'll ask you in that, um, in the email we send, if any of you would like to meet with us in a more of a planning kind of way to help us see what we can do locally, whether it's the Naima River or whether it's, you know, Irene Windlow's land or what might be the next steps in a very practical way to find the land we need. All righty. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Kathy. Everyone else is saying the same thing. And we're going to um, press the red button and, and finish the evening. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.